Trinity, I invite you to scan the QR code in your order of worship so you can share your contact information and sign up for the weekly email. I have a few announcements to highlight for everyone this morning. First, we have a new worship resource for in-person worship. Buy your hymnals uh, in the sanctuary. There's a blue series resources packet. This packet has the communion prayer and our song of preparation that we'll be using throughout the fall series. So please be sure to find that when you see it uh, listed in the bulletin that that's where the resource is. And be sure to leave it in your hymnals when you go today so that we can continue to use it throughout the rest of the series. Second, if you've been on the fence about volunteering with the new Westside ESL program, today's the deadline to be part of the first wave of people who will be serving. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet, you may still join with those who uh, have already volunteered who are having their orientation meeting in the fellowship hall during second hour today. If you are able, I encourage you to be part of this exciting work that will grow relationships with our neighbors and help people learning English feel more at home in this place. Finally, uh, you may sign up to order a new Trinity t-shirt and or sign up for the next round of Breaking Bread, either online or on the forums at the Welcome Center. I believe this is the last Sunday to sign up for this round of Breaking Bread. Now let's center ourselves for worship by singing our intro at number 527 in our red hymnals, Come Away from Rush and Hurry. you to rise in body or spirit as God calls us to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. May our worship reflect God's glory. The sky proclaims God's handiwork. May we see each other as the handiwork of God. Let our prayer and praise, our singing and proclamation be filled with the love of God. Together with Christians around the world, 
with God's people throughout time, let us worship. Our gathering song is number 575 in our red hymnals, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. In the rhythms of confession and assurance of pardon, we are built up as God's people. Let's participate in this formative work as we pray together. And when I pray, build us together in Christ, O God, I invite you to respond. Make us your dwelling place. Gracious God, you have called us to be your church, to serve together as the body of Christ in the world you so love. We confess that we have not built our lives on Christ's foundation. And so together we pray, build us together in Christ, O God. Make us your dwelling place. We confess how difficult we find it to truly love the people around us, to care as deeply for their well-being as for our own, to delight in their good fortune without feeling envious. Build us together in Christ, O God. Make us your dwelling place. We confess how often we act out of our own self-interest, putting our needs and desires ahead of the needs of others, hoarding our resources rather than sharing them freely. Build us together in Christ, O God. Make us your dwelling place. We confess how easy it is to do what we know is wrong, to rationalize our bad decisions and behaviors, to make excuses for our hurtful words and actions. Build us together in Christ, O God. Make us your dwelling place. May the foundation of our lives be Christ, 
that we might become your dwelling place on earth and serve as your temple in the world. Amen. Having confessed our failure to live as Christ's presence in the world, hear this good news. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. A community of hope, the new temple built up together in Christ, set aside for unlikely, even impossible deeds of grace. We are God's people. Believe this good news and live in its peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another. Are any other children that want to join us in the front for our prayer? You can come forward now. Good morning. Hi, Lena. All right. Are we all ready to pray? Let's pray. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here everywhere. If you are going up to children and worship, you can follow Miss Amanda upstairs. And for those of us who are staying here in the sanctuary, you can find your uh, seasonal resources, and we'll sing together our song of preparation, Restless Weaver. Restless Weaver, ever spinning. Threads of justice and shalom, dreaming patterns of creation, where all creatures find a home, gathering on life's very fiber, every texture, every
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read verses 17 through 22. You can find that on page 950 of our Sanctuary Bibles. In this letter, which was written to Gentile Christians, Paul is speaking about how God in Christ has drawn Jews and Gentiles to God's self and therefore united them with one another. Let us listen for the word of God. So Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 6, and that's on page 984 of our Sanctuary Bibles. The author of 1 Peter is also writing primarily to Gentile Christians and instructing them about how they are to live well in the world as followers of Christ. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, we are concluding our temple mini-series. We've spent the last few weeks exploring the way the image of the temple is woven through the entire story of scripture. The temple building in Jerusalem, we've seen, was intended to be much more than simply a building where the Jewish people gathered to worship and offer sacrifices. In the ancient Jewish mindset, the temple was the primary place of overlap between heaven and earth the place where God lived among God's people. The temple was intended to serve as a concentrated sign of the way all of creation is God's temple, the way God is present in all that God has made. And yet throughout history, God's people have twisted the temple into an idol. What was intended to serve as a sign of God's transforming presence and to inspire good and just and godly living in the world, in reality, oftentimes became a stumbling block, a barrier that kept God's people from truly experiencing God. The prophets themselves often railed against the temple system, the way the people's identity became rooted in temple rituals rather than in godly living. The way the walls of the temple became synonymous with the exclusion of outsiders. The way the sacrificial system became an economy of haves and have-nots, as unjust as any other economy in the world. And so, in the fullness of time, God templed in the world in a new and surprisingly intimate way. The word of God took on human skin, and as the gospel writer of John writes, the word pitched God's tabernacle among us in Jesus Christ. 
the most powerful place of overlap between heaven and earth, the fullest expression of God's presence among us was not a building, but a person, a person who lived and died and rose among us. This is the good news of the gospel. And yet, the temple of Jesus' body also created a foundational problem for the early, early church. If Jesus was God's presence in the world, but now Jesus has ascended, how do we meet God now? How does God reveal God's self now? No longer is it an option to sit at Jesus' feet in the same way, to practice the bodily presence of God among God's people. So now what? It's at this point in the story of scripture that a new picture of the temple emerges. After Jesus' resurrection and before his ascension, Jesus tells his followers that although he is going to leave them, They will not be left without God's presence, but that the spirit of God will come upon them and they will become Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Through the power of the spirit, Jesus' followers will become the presence of God in the world. Jesus' followers, the church, will be built into the new temple. That is why it was not a priority of the early church to build buildings in which to gather and to worship, so much so that they were often accused of being atheists by their neighbors. The culture in which they lived did not understand a religion without physical buildings where the gods were worshipped and received sacrifices. But the earliest Christians had a different model of God's presence in the world. Their God had been most fully present in a person. And even when that person returned to heaven, they knew that through the spirit, the overlap of heaven and earth was still most fully known in the world through people. And so in the New Testament letters, we get these moments of the church as the people of the church being described as the new temple where God dwells. To the church in Ephesus, Paul writes, in Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, into a dwelling place for God. To the church in Corinth, he writes, do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you. God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In 2 Corinthians, Paul declares, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. And later, the author of 1 Peter tells the churches in Asia that their lives must reflect Christ like living stones. They are being built into a spiritual house, a house with a holy priesthood and a house that offers spiritual sacrifices to God. After the ascension of Christ, the story of scripture tells us that the temple, the place of overlap between heaven and earth is no longer a building, is no longer even just one person living in one time, and in one place. Instead, through the power of the Spirit poured out on the followers of Christ, the temple is expanding exponentially from Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The temple is bursting out from those first exciting and confusing moments in the early church all the way to you and I today. We are now the temple of the living God, the place of overlap between heaven and earth. I don't know how that makes you feel, but I know how it makes me feel. It makes my chest feel a little tight. It makes my heart beat a little faster because who am I 
to serve as the temple of the living God. One of the great gifts of pastoral ministry for me is getting to lead the same liturgies again and again and again. If you've been around the Reformed tradition for a while, you know that our Reformed Reformed liturgies are typically heavy on words. Beautiful, rich words, but so many words that when I'm sitting in the congregation, it's often hard for me to take them all in. So that's why we do the same liturgies again and again and again. It's one of the reasons. But as a worship leader, as the one who gets to read those words again and again and again, who gets to read them and see them on a page and hear them too, over years of ministry, it has driven those words pretty deep down in my being. In many of our Reformed liturgies, particularly those liturgies where a person or a group of people are saying yes to God's grace are responding with a commitment, we have a paragraph that we usually read. It goes like this. By the Holy Spirit, all who believe and are baptized receive a ministry to witness to Jesus as Savior and Lord and to love and serve those with whom they live and work. We are ambassadors for Christ who reconciles and makes whole. We are the salt of the earth We are the light of the world. I have read those words numerous times in worship, and I confess that almost every single time, I want to put a question mark at the end because it seems ludicrous. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. God, that does not seem like a workable plan. How can the people of God be the temple of God in the world? Have we learned nothing from temple history in scripture? And many of us in this room know more people who have moved away from Jesus because of the living of the church than people who have been drawn toward Jesus. How could God entrust us with this sacred responsibility. The weight of it can feel like too much. The responsibility, impossible to fulfill. How can I live as the temple of God in the world? If that weight feels familiar to you, here is some good news. In every single passage in the New Testament that talks about God's people living as the temple of God, being built up into the dwelling place of the divine, in every one of those passages, the author is not writing to individuals, but to communities. It's always plural. Because I am actually not the temple. I am a brick. Pastor Corey Widmer reminds his congregation that their role as the temple is like a Lego creation. If you are into Legos, you know that these incredibly simple colored rectangles can, by creative artisans, be built into incredible creations. But alone, one Lego on the floor in the dark can inflict the worst kind of pain on an unsuspecting foot. Alone, one Lego is not worth much. You can't do almost anything good with one Lego, but together and in the hands of an artist, incredible things can be possible. Together, we are the temple. St. Lydia's church in New York City calls itself a dinner church. Each Sunday and Monday night, groups of around 30 people gather in a Brooklyn storefront to share a meal together. The service begins with the lighting of candles and the singing of songs. Then together, they pray an ancient and simple great prayer of thanksgiving. Then the pastor breaks the bread and sends it around the table and they begin a meal together, a full meal. 
after they eat, there's a time of scripture reading and discussion and prayer. And then they conclude the night with dishwashing and tidying things away. We do church this way, Pastor Emily Scott says, because people are looking for Jesus. People are looking for Jesus. And when we sit down together and break bread, we glimpse Jesus for a moment in one another's eyes. People are looking for Jesus. And through the power of the Spirit, we are being built into the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We together are being built into the temple of the living God. We serve as the temple for one another. Together we are built into the place where heaven and earth meet. But here's the tricky thing, but the important thing. The place where God's people have so often missed the point. The temple isn't just for the people within its walls. For able-bodied Jewish men with everyone else kept at some layer of distance. In Christ, we see that the temple is truly the place where all people can be met by God. So together in Christ, we are built together to be God's temple. Having seen Christ in one another, we live our lives serving as the temple in the world, wherever we go. When we leave this place, we live as the temple in the choices we make and the routines that fill our days. We are the temple when we choose to live more simply so that we can share with those in need. We are the temple when we volunteer at a local school to read with a child who's struggling or to bake cupcakes for a class party or to donate school supplies. We are the temple when we make time and space to listen to a coworker share her joys and sorrows. We are the temple when we cultivate beauty in our homes and our yards, when we pick up trash on our daily dog walk, when we doodle or zentangle. We are the temple when we show up to the polls to vote the values of God's reign into policy. We are the temple when we protest injustice with our neighbors and when we hold a crying child after a long day at school. We are the temple when we check our email, when we balance our budgets, when we fold our laundry. Built up together into the temple of God, we live as the temple in the routines of our daily work and play. We live as the temple when we reflect the presence, power, and love of our God. We can't finish a mini-series on the temple without a glimpse of the fullness of time. For even there, the temple is woven through. In the book of Revelation, John receives a vision from God of what is to come, a vision to hold on to in difficult days. We might imagine that in this vision, the temple in Jerusalem is restored to its former glory, or better yet, made perfect and holy in a way no earthly artisan could. But instead, what we see in Revelation is a return all the way back to the beginning, when God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Friends, in those days when we are disappointed with the temple here and now, within us and around us, 
with the twisted image of God that the church so often projects into the world, with the ways we ourselves have failed to reflect the overlap of heaven and earth. Let us indeed lament what is broken. Let us confess our failures. And let us cling to the good news of the vision. Hold on to these words, for they are trustworthy and true. That in the end of days, the home of God, once again, will be among humankind. God will dwell with us. We shall be God's people and God will be with us. The temple of God is all around us. The temple of God has come to us in Christ. The temple of God meets us in the people of God. And soon we will need the temple no longer. But God will dwell with us again. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for those places of overlap between heaven and earth, in creation, in buildings, in people. We pray that you would build us up to serve as your temple in the world until you come again. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit for our song of response. It's number 266 in our red hymnal. The Church of Christ cannot be bound. In a moment when all things are ready, we'll invite you to come forward to receive communion. You can come forward to the two center aisles. At the font, we invite you to touch the water and remember in your baptism, God claims you as God's beloved child. Then you can go to a station on either side and receive a piece of gluten-free bread from a server and take a cup of juice to drink. You can put your empty cup on the stations on either side and then return to your seats through the side aisles. If you prefer to remain in your seat, you can just raise a hand and we'll bring communion to you where you are. Now, let us pray together. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them up, up to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. In the beginning of time, you spoke all things into being, shaping creation as a temple where you might dwell with your people. Even when we ran from your presence, you, spent, you sent prophets and priests to guide us back so that we might worship you and enjoy you forever. And so with your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. righteous God, in the fullness of time you sent Jesus Christ into the world as a temple of your Holy Spirit, that we might meet you face to face. On the night before he died at supper with the disciples, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, And gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Pour it out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection. Until you come again, until you come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that this bread and cup may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Through this feast, may we be strengthened to live as temples of your presence in the world, sharing your light and life with all creation. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth and woven together into your reign. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the bread of life. Let, Let all who, who hunger, hunger come, come and, and eat. This is the cup of salvation. Let, Let all who thirst come, come and drink. drink. These are the gifts of God. For the people of God. Let us come for all things are now ready.
Having been fed at God's table, we offer a prayer of gratitude and intercession. God of new creation, thank you for meeting us at this table and shaping us into the living stones you use to make your temple. Through the bread and cup, we are shaped to receive mercy and serve you in this world. In response to your grace, we offer you our gifts, our offerings, our lives. Use them to make your presence known on earth. We pray for all the broken stones of your temple throughout the world. Tear down the parts of your church that do not fit with Christ as the cornerstone. Shape us through repentance and transformation to be your people, built up by mercy into a house of peace. We pray for the governments of the world and their leaders. Grant especially President Biden, Governor Whitmer, and Mayor Bliss wisdom and courage to do what is good. Turn all nations from imperialistic conquest and colonialist exploitation. Show us the way to build peace for all nations so that we all may flourish and have what we need. We pray for rain and sun in proper measure and for abundant food and clean water for all on earth. As we anticipate years where food supplies might be tight, help us to grow enough food and to do so in ever more sustainable ways. Bring deliverance to those in Puerto Rico struggling with all the damage caused by the wind and water of a hurricane. Give the people of Haiti the resources and systems they need to restore order deliver justice, and revive the ecosystem of their land. Help the people of Canada recover from the damage and disorder the storm there has caused. We pray for the sick and those in need, and any oppressed by wounds of the soul. We thank you for Susan Oltoff's successful knee replacement surgery, and ask you to grant her patience, endurance, and peace as she engages in the difficult work of rehabilitation. We ask for comfort for Christina Horton and wisdom for her doctors as they work to determine if surgery will be necessary or helpful. Give Christina relief, energy, and patience as she waits. We pray for good grief for the family of Harry Brummel and for all who mourn the death of loved ones. We pray for our neighbors, that they might live together in harmony, and that the strangers among us will find friendship. We ask your blessing on Westside ESL as it begins this week. May relationships and language fluency grow hand in hand. May your love and concern for building up the lives of all people together be made manifest. 
We pray, too, for our enemies, for those people in our lives we find hard to love, and for the Russian leaders waging war against Ukraine, and the Iranian leaders persecuting women for not covering their heads. Lead our enemies to repentance, forgiveness, and peace, too. God of new creation, through Christ you are building us all up into more than we dare ask or imagine. In your Spirit's power, help us to live lives that testify to your presence among us as they embody the prayer you teach us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our song of sending is number 296 in our red hymnals. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing, We Are Called.
after worship, ESL volunteers are invited down to the fellowship hall at 1130 for their training. And there will be a second hour class here in the sanctuary for other adults if you're interested in that. And now I invite you to join hands, to raise your hands as a sign of our unity in Christ. And as we go from this place to live as the temple of our God in the world, we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.